Hello, you're watching Telecom TV. I'm Martin Warwick and we're reporting in from Barcelona at Mobile World Congress 2013. And this time I'm talking with John Woodgett, who is Global Director, Telecom Service Provider Segment with Intel. John, it's good to see you again. This show has always been about devices, and it still is, but it seems to me that the infrastructure part of it is now taking a bigger and bigger role. Do you agree with that analysis? Yes, I think in infrastructure has typically been in the back room. It's not something that's very user-friendly to display, but of course it's the core asset of the service providers, so it's really important to them. But uh, I think in future it's going to be two shows. I think the, uh, the infrastructure is going to come out of the closet and it's going to transform this world. And I also think that the smartphone part of the show is going to transform as well. I think we're moving out of the uh, new shiny object phase into a very, very tough battle where there's going to be some commoditization. Of course, that's of huge benefit to the end users because they're going to get fabulous phones at much better cost, and we're going to see much more proliferation of the technology globally. But that, of course, then throws traffic onto the network, and that's why the network transformation is so critical. John, have you seen evidence of this on the Intel booth and in the conversations you've been having with customers, suppliers, etc.? I think that's what surprised me because a lot of the conversations Intel has in developing long term silicon technologies are in the back room under non-disclosure agreements and I really didn't expect to see so much of those conversations out in the aisles here at Mobile World Congress. Uh, the demonstrations are there on the NEC stand for the public to see around software-defined networks in Evolve Packet Core running as a virtualized workload on a software-defined platform just like an IT platform. Um, we here on the Intel stand have got a, an EPC demonstration that's uh, very compelling. But it's the conversation that is coming to us from all corners of the ecosystem. Network function virtualization, software defined networks seem to be on everybody's lips. With networks integrating and changing so radically, let's talk about what those changes are and what the technologies are. Can we start with SDN? a software-defined network. What is it? Well, at the very highest level, a software-defined network separates the hardware from the software uh, so that the software has a uniform platform to run on and it means that all sorts of software innovation can happen and it'll run on multiple supplier platforms as opposed to historically in the communications arena, the platforms were vertically integrated, like the old mainframe days. You wanted an application, you bought a server, it ran the application. So that's the highest level. If you drill down a little bit closer, a bit deeper into what's happening here, the, the network is, di is slightly different from a data center. It's distributed. So the technologies required to run the packets across that network have to run at fantastic speeds. You need much higher speeds than you needed in the, in the data center. So it's taken some time for the silicon technologies to get fast enough to be able to bring that compute capability into the network. But that's really what's driving the transformation today. And the second one, newish buzz phrase to me, certainly, I can't even remember what it stands for yet, but it's NFV, Network Function Virtualization. What is it and why is it of such importance? So the network functions, it might be, uh, for example, a, a broadband remote access server, a BRAS. Uh, it may be in the mobile network, um, an SGSN or a GGSN. Um, in a, in a LTE network, a serving server or a packet server. These are functions that can run on a proprietary platform or they can run on a standard, off-the-shelf, high-performance server. It's the kind of servers you'll find in a data center. When you can run those network workloads, network functions, in this environment, virtually, what you're doing is you're pooling your compute resources and having these network functions running as virtualized functions in that, that standard computer environment. You more or less preempted my next question there, John, when you mentioned standards, but I'll carry forward anyway with it, because it seems to me that with all the changes that are taking place in networks, you're going to have to need standards and proper standardization. Is that what's happening or is it still very, very proprietary? Well, it's got to happen. 
if you don't have the standardization, you don't get these horizontal separations from of, of hardware from software. So the standards have to develop. In this environment, uh, there are initiatives to create the standards. So you mentioned network function virtualization. The operators have got together to form a foundation, the Network Function Virtualization Foundation, NVFV. It's a real mouthful. I wish there was something a bit easier to describe it by. But they've got together, and they're working with Etsy to try and hammer out how do we standard standardize in the network function arena. I can't let you go without asking you about two other big issues, cloud and big data. Let's start with cloud. Tell us about it and why, again, it is so important. When you create data center type flexibility in the network, you can create a cloud in the network. Cloud is just shared resources that's accessed over the network. At the moment, the cloud is confined to the data center. But as you bring these standard servers into the network, the cloud can run in the network. So services can run in the network. They don't have to run in a data center. Those services can run right out to the edge of the network and give you far better user experiences and also reduce the traffic over the network, which means you're exploiting the network connectivity assets, the things that are so valuable and slow down the traffic, exploiting them better. So it reduces costs for the service providers, increases service uh, value for the end users. So that's the cloud part of it. And so what about big data? So again, big data is best known in the in the IP data centers. So the Googles, Amazons, Ebays, um, any of the internet over the top services providers have masses of data in huge data centers. What the service providers have is a geographically distributed compute environment. What that means is they can't get all this data in one place at one time. So they're looking at techniques to analyze the data from the many sources throughout the network to be able to figure out what is happening. Now, this is the really, really interesting piece. If you're Google, you have access to the Google stream of data. If you're Facebook, you have access to the Facebook stream of data. If you're a service provider, you have access to everything, every piece of data, every packet. What the service providers can do is they can anonymize that data, protect your security and personality, but they can look at clusters of data within all of that massive traffic and extract information about what are users doing, where are they, how are they spending their time, how are they spending their money. That data is extremely valuable to deliver services to those users. So the service providers have realized that this is a whole new business model that is emerging for them to augment their communication service. So it's a very, very hot topic. And on the stand here, one of the uh, displays that we have is a, a software company called Guavas, who are actually mining this data at the moment to help the service providers understand what their customers, what their subscribers are doing so they can optimize their services to them. But they could equally use that data to sell to the Googles, Facebooks, etc. of this world to enable those guys to optimize their service delivery. Are you saying that for service providers, life is about to get somewhat better? Because presumably, with all the data they have access to and own, it's new revenue streams just waiting to be drawn from. Absolutely right. Now, this is nirvana for the operators. They've been searching for a unique asset that can bring new revenue streams on top of connectivity. They're faced with declining revenues, as everybody knows. This is a unique asset. This is an asset that the, that the over-the-top internet service providers do not have. They're going to have to work with the service providers. They're going to have to pay the service providers if they want access to this asset. John Budget, thanks very much. You're welcome.